Well, good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's coming through OK. And a very warm welcome from the Carlis Towers for our first policy webinar of the year, um, looking at no a very important subject, which is going to become assume great importance as the year goes on, AI. Um, and the theme of our webinar today is ahead of the curve and sticking to the tracks, principles and governance strategies for AI across local government. Um, so the, the guidelines for today, we are going to talk and converse amongst ourselves. Uh, I've got some expert presenters who I'll introduce shortly. And at the end of our hour, we shall pack up and see how we can advance the conversation beyond then. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm Jonathan Warren, Chief Executive of the Carvis. We've been looking around as, 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 as a place-based think tank, place service integration, efficiencies, the role of digital for, for many, many years. Um, I put it to us, we, we live in revolutionary times, um, times of unfathomable technological progress, which we which we, we experience it in, in different ways. I, I guess I can only say um, to adapt, um, Lenin, you, you, you may well not be interested in AI and data analysis, but it sure as hell is interested in you. Um, we got a, a, a dy dynamic landscape here in local government um, because of all the, 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 the well-rehearsed challenges local government has in terms of increased demands, limited resources. AI is often sort of presented as the, um, the promise, sometimes the panacea of making everything better, the, 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 um, the, the, the silver bullet, the um, spoonful of medicine um, to make everything better. But we, we've been through these sort of epochs of promised transformational change before in various times of the digital revolution. Um, but this might offer something for public services and council functions that is um, generally different. Now, here we are at the end of March. Earlier in the month, we had Chance of Jeremy Hunt's budget, in which we had the promise, well, the threats, some might say, of the public sector productivity plans, of which, if you read through the, the, the Treasury documents, AI is seen as pivotal um, in, in this, and how um, local authorities are doing their coursework work or homework ahead of their the July deadline for submitting their own plans in exchange for um, the extra largesse remains to be seen. We've got the local government angle, but that, as I said, fits in a wider national AI strategy, which essentially seeks to position the UK as a front runner in AI. You know, we've got DeepMind, we've got you know, the tech unicorns um, clustered around parts of um, London and, and, and Cambridge doing this. So there is a, a concerted push to leveraging this technology to enhance services, to push economic development, and and public governance. Um, AI is going to have a crucial role in driving operational efficiencies and supporting strategic decision making across industry and the public sector. Um, however, we're here to talk about its role in local government and local governance in particular. And we do have um, certain complex challenges, but that will, I hope, over the course of our conversation today, um, suggest a nuanced approach is, is needed. Here in local government, we've got you no know, constant issues of public perception, underscored as always by concerns around privacy, data security and trust. And so it's all going to demand a sort of governance framework that's both transparent, responsible, but also inclusive, that ensures that how local government uses AI and integration meets public expectations and is stamped like a stick of Blackpool Rock all the way through with strong ethical standards um, so that you know, people understand it's it's there, it's being deployed equally across all communities. Um, once you've got that out of the way, the short issue for our council leaders and finance officers, how do we fund all this? Um, I said we've got the, the, the financial constraints faced by local authorities that in itself is an existing hurdle to investing upfront in AI and the data analytics 
infrastructure. Um, coupled with this, you know, gaps in skills and digital and IT competencies, given the, 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 um, the recruitment difficulties and the wage differentials between industry and local government. So I, we'd argue the local government's at a crossroads here in needing to balance a couple of things, the immediate financial pressures with the long term strategic benefits of um, AI implementation. So this is really the, the context to the webinar the Carlos are organising here today with our, our corporate partners, Trous and Hamlins, with our expert speakers, Rachel McCoy, well, president of lawyers in local government, Councillor Elizabeth Campbell, leader of the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, Amadeep Gill, head of public sector and partner at Trous and Hamlins. And if we can move her into presenter mode, Emma Oppelford, the founder of Outcomes Matter. So what we've signed up for today in the next 55 minutes or so is to debate amongst ourselves in a conversation um, what are the sort of principles and governance frameworks this new revolutionary technology will um, require so that we can both build trust and manage the risks of use. How can we sure we have a ethical AI governance that, governance that enhances local service delivery and revolutionizes the operational efficiency of local authorities and going beyond this um, support high level strategic tasks such as um, supporting public sector data analytics to policy making in all sorts of ways, um, doing it in, in, in an, an inclusive, inclusive way, way and, and making, making sure, sure that, that it's um, um, works with the collaborative sort of public leadership we're looking for today um, with the, the, the emphasis on combined authorities and local authorities total place version 2.0 and all that to improve outcomes and i guess the trick will be finding a way so to do across public sector silos and sectors in a way that boosts joint working while at the same time respecting boundaries and differences across different public sector ecosystems. Otherwise, as a localist think tank, we would say this anyway, we do run the risk that AI becomes another tool of consolidation and centralisation that strips out local power and agency um, from local communities and local governments. So this is the rules. This is what we signed up for for the next 50 minutes or so. So we're going to explore how the challenges can be addressed. This is a platform for dialogue and exchange. So um, in terms of the format, I'm going to ask our panellists to say a few few words of their own perspective on this before we move out to talk between ourselves and open up for Q&A. Um, uh, in terms of guiding questions, I've asked our panellists to look at a couple of things. You, you can take it or leave it panellists because they're only guidelines. But for example, what principles and governance frameworks do we think are needed to build trust and manage risks? Um, in what ways do we think can AI enhance public service delivery and the operational efficiency of local authorities, given we have this productivity drive, whether we like it or not? And what do we see for local government as the primary challenges in integrating this revolutionary AI technology and the advanced data analytics into everyday council functions and services? So. That's enough from me. Um, I'm going to do the, the impartial and fair way of asking our speakers just, just to come up and say a few words in alphabetical order, if that's OK. So if I can <laughs> ask you first, um, Elizabeth, followed by Amadeep and Rachel, we'll get the conversation started. So Elizabeth, okay. over to you, please. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I'd like to say I think the first thing is we should be really excited because I think AI can improve service delivery. You know, first of all, by freeing up officers to be on the front line, because the whole back office functions we ought to be able to transform. And secondly, by freeing up officers and money to be redeployed to more complex cases, such as social care. So it has, it has a, a, a double import. I think it can also really improve how we deal with customer experience because we've got predictive tools now to assess future need, and it can also analyze service feedback. So there are so many advantages. But at the same time, I guess we're what we're here today to discuss as well is how we should also be cautious. 
because I think uh, councils quite often are not generally, uh, well, we probably don't have strong enough or large enough procurement teams to deliver AI solutions at pace or at scale. And maybe it comes back to what you were just saying, Jonathan, we need to also think, well, we're thinking about AI, we're, we're thinking about all the governance. We also need to think about governance more broadly, cross, cross borders, cross boroughs, maybe more pan-London coordination would help. Um, and finally, there's big risks if we get data securities breached, or indeed, actually, even before data security, we put the wrong inputs in. Wrong inputs means wrong outputs. So I'll leave it just there, and uh, we can discuss other advantages and risks, et cetera, with you all, unless you want me to go through some advantages now. No, that's perfect. Perfect, and um, well, well, well positioned there, Elizabeth. Thanks. That's a wonderful start for us. Amity, what are what are your th general thoughts before we move on on, on where yeah. we are on this? Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and just building on that, um, so we recently did a report on the benefits and challenges of AI generally across industry. But I think it. Um, AI as a tool represents kind of specific issues for the local government sector and um, Councillor Campbell has kind of addressed some of the, the salient points there but for me I think there is an opportunity really to use AI to, to provide for a personalised experience so I've done channel shift crop projects for 20 years um, across the sector but AI and AI enabled chatbots allow access 24-7 uh, to information and services in a way that we haven't seen before that is in real time um, and when I was doing various projects you'd get very complex users wanting face-to-face -face time which is expensive uh, and resource intensive and actually AI gives the opportunity to give that real personalized experience and the public sector sits on huge data sets that if analyzed can really result in uh, efficiencies and we just don't have the time the money or the uh, opportunity to do that. Yet AI presents this opportunity to drill down, see correlations, see where resources required. We're doing yeah. interesting projects in the transport space where we're using these big data sets and using AI to work through them to help on transport planning, to work, find out where sensors are needed to work on pollution, to see how we can improve air quality. The, you know, the, the opportunities now are, are seismic and combine that with other technologies coming down the track, because AI is only one of them. But when we've got super, super powered edge computing uh, um, coming down the track as well, combining all of that is going to be a phenomenal opportunity. Um, uh, and you can exploit those big data sets that the public sector sit, um, sits on in a way that we haven't been able to before. Uh, and I think um, in as as the councillor mentioned it's the ability to emancipate people and create efficiencies and direct human resource in a place that isn't doing the day-to-day -day, the stuff that actually it can be done in a much more efficient way through technology but i think the challenges that we talked about previously in our, in our round table and i think much more pronounced in public sector is uh, the concept of bias and fairness how can these decisions be made in a transparent way uh, and, you know, Rachel, as monitoring officer, um, knows that, you know, we we live and die by the, the power of decisions that we make because they are the ones that can be challenged under public law. If you're um, um, delegating that decision making to an AI um, enhanced um, chatbot or otherwise, how do you ensure that that algorithm isn't actually making decisions based on biased data sets? Um, or, or making them uh, in a way that actually isn't conducive to the, the overall running of that particular um, authority. And I think um, we talked about privacy being a barrier and cybersecurity, you know, as the government is about to set out a new position on China based on a potential cyber attack to the Electoral Commission. Yeah. This data is so sensitive. How do you ensure that it is protected? Um, and how do you ensure that we take people um, on that journey with us, because this will have an impact on the way that officers operate, potentially how councillors receive information. Uh, and actually that change journey, that cultural change journey can't be underestimated in all of this. So there's some initial thoughts um, building on 
um, what we've heard al already, but probably um, I think there's a lot more to come, I suspect. No, Amadeep, thank you so much for that wonderful contribution. Rachel, finally, you, from your um, laws and local government perspective, what do yeah. you see that the risks and opportunities of AI and how do you, opening thoughts on how governance arrangements through this? So, firstly, yeah, just to echo the kind of the possibilities kind of, you know, to make fruitful, good, lasting change, like to, you know, to deliver for our communities in the right way, right things, you know, in, in the right time. But before I get on to that, I think I just wanted to touch upon what Amadip just talked about there, which is that kind of that public confidence bit about trust, which is integral to, you know, ethics and doing the right things, you know, making sure we do that and really taking our communities with us. So that whole trust piece where, let's face it, like Joe Public has kind of lost that, uh, a lot of that along the way, just just the world we, we live in at the moment. And then there comes this kind of, you know, juggernaut coming down the tracks and people are really worried about these things. So I think that as part of that trust, um, and then, you know, I'll, I'll touch upon the governance aspects. We need strong leadership in this space. I mean, last week I was at the MJ Future Forum and it's, it's wonderful. I love it. But all the chiefs in the room, like, you know, we had a session on AI, Norfolk are doing wonderful things. But it was just shocking to me that a lot of our chiefs, um, you know, doing an outstanding job, but they, they just don't really know what this is all about, um, which I find that worrying because you know these are our leaders that need to then help you know take our communities with us as well and in their hands kind of have kind of this technology technological solution that can help in so many ways place building looking after our vulnerable doing things really like an intelligent smart smarter way and for the public purse as well you know we serve our communities and it's public money. So I just thought, wow, that really needs a whole shift because it's almost like, you know, like jokes in the room, but it's like, I don't see that as jokes. I see this as actual integral stuff. We need to upskill our officers in local government, our leaders, and also members as well to bring them along on that journey so they understand and can help do that piece with building that trust and confidence with communities. Uh, down on the ground. So anyway, I just had to get that out there because I, it's so fresh in my mind from last week. Um, but in terms of the the governance piece, it's everything, isn't it? It's uh, making sure we've got good openness, transparency, we've got safeguards, protections, monitoring, good policies, good protocols in place, ensuring that big decisions are rooted through that governance um, center in an authority you know if we need to do data um, assessments and make sure that any decisions on kind of procuring AI and what that means in terms of risk and the wider implications is kind of looked at through that lens of you know legalities data protection information and doing the right thing as well um, so it can't be just left kind of without that lens over it because once information is out there um, then that's it we've kind of lost track of it um, and that's really really important in that cyber protection security space so it's so huge there's like layers and layers and layers and there's loads of excellent resource out there from the ICO soccer team are doing amazing work in this space as well and setting some of those kind of like toolkits that we can use in local government because it's always like where do we start what do we do um and policies like kind of draft um frameworks that we can kind of like use as a basis which is, is super incredibly helpful um so yeah so i think it's all of those things essentially i mean all our legislative provisions still apply in terms of information security. They haven't left us. Um, and it's it's going to be imperative that we work with our regulators closely going forward um, and just ensuring that we stay ahead of the curve. And we can do that in local government again, and be on that front foot. So, you know, let's just kind of embrace it, but upskill our people. Many thanks, Rachel, Elizabeth, and Amadeep. Um, Amadeep, in a, 
Elizabeth, do you, any initial responses to, to what Rachel's had? So, Elizabeth, you want to come in, I see. Yes, I'd say, I mean, of, of course, we have to be incredibly careful. And I ex absolutely echo what Rachel says about getting the right governance in and watching about data and data security. And, you know, as Amadeep said, you know, all this stuff about China and interfering in local elections. I absolutely accept that. But I think there are some sort of smaller, quicker wins on the ground that we don't have to say, as a council, we're going to do enormous great things. For example, um, in Kensington, Chelsea, we're using AI to um, look at graffiti. So <laughs> you can send a photo of a bit of a graffiti in, and rather than have people go through it and then decide who's going to do it, it'll just be done by AI. And if there's a swastika on it or something terrible, then it'll go up the level, you know, someone needs to get out today. And that's that's sort of quite a simple thing, which will just really help, you know, treat uh, street rubbish or, or graffiti, something very simple and not very sensitive. Uh, another um, good example, I think, is um, using predictive, the sort of the predictive power of AI and I'll give you an example. We have a uh, hazard of multiple occupation at the moment. We'll have people going down the street and we have a sort of qualitative effect. So we kind of think, oh, well, in this area, it is more likely. And so an officer might go to a team of officers, go to an area, go down the street. Twenty five percent, they'll find hazard of multiple occupation. But actually, with predictive stuff with AI, we can then send them to streets where it will be. 75 percent so it's much better use of time okay. so on things like that which are relatively small things which can bubble up or i don't know writing reports writing tricksy emails 75 percent can be done with copilot and then you need someone to go over to check 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 that you're not sending out something which has <laughs> got some terrible error in it so i think there's lots of little ways we can start without being incredibly fearful that we're going to overset the mark and we're letting everything, you know, the cat out of the bag, as it were. So, again, I'd say I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. Excellent, very good, positive stuff. Amity. Yeah, can, can I say that really great contributions for, from both of you. Uh, and, you know, I concur with all of that. That, that journey has already started. And yes. Mental. It's not going to be a big bang. Um, mm -hmm. Ha but however, it has to be uh, presented in what has become a societal conversation about AI and the yeah. fourth revolution. And I think actually um, lots of authorities are already using AI. We are all probably um, engaging on a platform that is using AI to get us um, to our today. So, you know, it's an in it is an inevitable part of our existence at the moment. But I think it has to be contextualised that over the last um, year to 18 months, it has become a, a topic of conversation. And actually, you know, it's broadly been demonised in certain ways, um, uh, especially when you speak to some people and they're worried about it becoming sentient and making decisions and all of that kind of stuff. And this uh, apocalypse that may ensue. And actually, genuine, some people genuinely hold that view about AI. Um, mm -hmm. But tell them actually it's been part of your life for the last however years when you are using Facebook when you're using social media when you're applying for loans um it, it becomes the normalization of actually a technology that's been around for a very long time and council I think you make a really important point there it there can be no avoidance of human oversight uh, on anything goes on so it's that repurposing and reskilling that Rachel spoke about and you Jonathan at the outset that actually we're the rather than actually doing the initial work or the, the very ground level preparation of something um, the human oversight element of it becomes the expert oversight the overseer of quality standards the overseer of um, you know public law principles and actually integrating that into uh, an effective governance mechanism will will actually require a bit of a, a review of constitutions uh, a little bit of uh, consideration of how delegation happens but I don't think there is a, an absolute removal of that human oversight element because mm -hmm. Um, that will be the final arbitrator of a lot of those public law principles that we all hold dear. 
And actually, I think there needs to be a conversation around this public, meaningful public engagement to mm. tackle all the perceptions that have emerged over the last uh, particularly year to 18 months around it being such a fundamental shifter of how we experience the world, it will be gradual. It will probably, with every industrial revolution before it, it will be seismic with regard to what the start was and what the end is. However, and this is a much more concentrated revolution, I think, than any of the ones that preceded it, but actually, the more we talk about it, the more of the value that we're adding. And, and I really like the way that we're we're focusing in on the positives here rather yeah. than the, the fear mongering that I've heard in previous um, settings. Not not yours, Jonathan. You've <laughs> positive and upbeat. Uh, but I do think people need to to know that it's going to be fair, that there's going to be equity in decision making, that actually they can speak to someone that is a human if they really need to. Where yeah. where. The vast majority of us are, are digital natives, but there's a whole roster of our communities that we serve that just do not like computers, um, let alone anything that is AI, AI enabled. Mm -hmm. And we can't leave those behind. So mm -hmm. I think you know, a, a, a layering uh, and incremental approach to all of this, but not forgetting that we, we serve very diverse communities, some which will be absolutely comfortable with this concept of AI uh, and what it can do to those that actually don't even have a, a smartphone. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a challenge of um, actually communication and implementation um, and actually resourcing and reskilling as much as it is, is in, in terms of application and uh, anything else. And my, my, it appears that there's some groundworks happening outside my house. So if there's any background noise, I, I do apologise. And that's what I'm going to hand over to Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> we can't hear it. We can't oh, that's hear great. it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, absolutely. I think um, that's a really impo important point that, you know, that no one gets left behind in terms of that, you know, the digital agenda and that kind of um exclusion in terms of digital exclusion which mm. it exists already so just to ensure that as far as we can that it, we're on the front foot on that and to make sure that the, the 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 kind of the gap doesn't widen and widen and people feel more disenfranchised because that 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 wouldn't be good at, at all and just ensuring that equity which again comes into like those conversations knowing our communities well and I suppose that's where AI and data analytics kind of comes in as well doesn't it where you can have the whole like you can target services it's tailor something especially for that person and uh, last week uh, Norfolk were talking about a really interesting project that they've got on the go using AI to uh, identify it's like loneliness you know because it's more rural communities and kind of isolation and loneliness is a, it's a real big thing you know and for some people you know it's, it's heartbreaking really so that people are so alone and feel so kind of excluded away from communities so they're really using AI to target those individuals and bring the services to them which again this is this is the amazing things that we can do and there are those yeah loads of like kind of operational um um examples where AI is doing things like um you know helping social workers prepare their reports like really easily you know with all the safeguards uh, you know uh, uh, surrounding it uh, I must say um um some are using it for their constitutions as well so that uh, I think um is it Hillenden I think are looking at they're working on something like this so instead of like kind of trying to decipher the dark art sometimes it's like that that's how people feel about constitutions not me though a big lover of constitution but you know it's always a little bit um one of those documents that people just like I don't I don't understand it we could just type and it would just find exactly you know what 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 the the delegation is or whatever so this is joy I mean bring this on like ASAP so lots of good stuff and I think we could almost do with you know, like more in that comm space, even like national campaign, local campaigns about, you know, just the the positives of this. And also, did you know, like every chat box or just even just the way you go about just doing your banking, just so many things are just the technology. That's what do you think is kind of driving that. So I think 
we need to invest a bit in that because we're going to be using this technology more and more. So if people start to get comfortable and go, yeah, this is actually this is cool and it's not like robots taking over the world type thing. Um, that will go a long, long way in this space. And also just to reiterate, you know, not a doom and gloom, but there are those protections and safeguards still there. We still have our, you know, our public law principles and all everything that kind of um, protects um, us as Joe Public. And then we've got all the statute, statutory provisions as well. They're still there. Um, and it just it's just really interesting. I was looking at the um, kind of, the UK's approach to this because it's more it's about like let regulators deal with this we're not going to legislate and in Europe it's more no they are legislating so that would be interesting just to see what the divergence is on that because the world just becomes kind of more smaller in a way like it would that that's, that's, that's one for a future thing but what that looks like um in terms of making sure we're aligned with kind of what's happening, you know, just just over the channel, really. Um, so I thought that was really, really interesting. And I know that we've got, I think, until April for all the regulators to come and put forth their strategic plans on, on this. And the government's really expediting this work as part of their hub. So, yeah, it'd be, yeah I'm really interested to see where, where that develops. Many thanks indeed. Another consideration, I think, so Elizabeth, you you, you raised this. Obviously, you've got um, talked about you know, as a London borough. I know you live in a wider ecosystem, the, the G, GLA, and it, and I do want to ask a question on on this. You know, we we last year, Amity, we had our our webinar on combined authorities and their potential greater role in shaping the market for public services. Um, and they do have that, 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 that and um so and I'm just really sort of talking into the, the, the political realities after the next general election, in which there will be I think a greater emphasis on total place integration across wider public sector silos in a way to maximize available resources to drive efficiency. And you can see how in this, um, I say in, in contrast to the, the big data bandwagon, you can see immediately how AI is transforming things through your, through the power of your own phone or websites um how is there anything we think might need to change to have um, um better um e e better use of ai and other emerging technologies to fulfill that promise of um whole place integration that's really not a technocratic exercise but as, as you know you, you everyone's been saying earlier is around personalized services based around individual communities wards and ultimately human beings um what 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 are the challenges what do we see the opportunities immediately elizabeth over to you first well, well you think about it as just a pan london thing there are lots of different ways that boroughs can use stuff um which then can replicate or they can be uh the champions of for example think about smart traffic management so AI powered traffic management systems to optimize traffic flows, reduce congestion, improve air quality. And Transport for London, for example, uses AI algorithms to analyze real time traffic data and then adjust traffic signals accordingly. And that's something which is completely sort of pan London. Then you've got the whole thing about in London, there's a huge problem about demand for housing, homelessness, um, because of rising rising demand and 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 basically falling supply. Mm. Uh, again, predictive analytics there to forecast what the housing demands are going to be, identify areas at risks of homelessness, uh, looking at demographic data, housing trends. Not only can they allocate resources councils within their own boroughs, but it will help other places in London. So, for example, in Kensington and Chelsea, uh, homelessness is such that the, we can't place people within the borough. We'll be placing them around London. So it, it works for us as, as an exporter, as I would say, of, of, of people. But it would also help uh, Darren Rodwell, my opposite number in Barking and Dagenham, 
because he can start to plan and see how many people are coming his way. You know, his his need for schools and educate, you know, we may be closing them in central London. Everyone needs to open them in, in out of London. Yeah. So again, AI can help both of us to sort of look ahead and plan uh, fraud detection and prevention. You know, all London car boroughs, well, not all London, some London boroughs are leveraging AI to look at that. Westminster Council has AI powered fraud detection to look at irregularities and anonymies and benefit claims. And that helps to self safeguard public funds and actually share fair, you know, have fair distribution of the funds. That's something that they're doing, which again, can be translated against council. So it's a bit like what you were saying, Rachel. It's almost like not a top down approach. It's like a lot of us are doing different things. Some of it is pan London. Some of it will bubble up and then people will say, oh, that's great. How did you do that? Let's do that. So environmental, let's let's talk about environmental mm -hmm. monitoring. Mm -hmm. You know, London Council's doing envir environmental monitoring, uh, Greenwich Council's use AI pad sensors to do air quality, healthcare support. That's another fan. So mm. I think it's exactly that. We're not having a top down, completely regulatory research. We're saying, how does it help? How can we find bits which work? And then the regulation comes in when we're thinking, well, have we got enough depth within our procurement within individual council to decide which bits that we're taking off the shelf? Do we have that? rigor do we have that governance to make sure that we're buying things which are appropriate and which will protect our data etc okay. amber deep you got your hand up please come in next i, I thought that was a really uh, great summary of how ai is already being uh, of significant benefit to the mm. sector and um whether that be looking at homelessness and helping with homelessness or mental health issues or social isolation, as uh, Rachel was talking about earlier. I just wanted to lift it up a little bit more and look at the kind of strategic issues as well. And I, and I think you've raised those there as well. I think um, on some of the earlier data, uh, data analysis projects that I worked on, there was uh, a need for collaboration with the private sector. And, and actually what happened was uh, local authorities got caught in kind of proprietary software that was really hard to emancipate yeah. themselves from or do anything um, subsequent uh, to <laughs> that particular relationship or go with another provider. I think those lessons really have to, to be inbuilt here because I do think we need collaboration with uh, research institutions and tech firms to accelerate the innovation and knowledge sharing, but really learn from some of those previous lessons that we've learned on technology projects previously about locking yourself in um, yeah. and and a vendor lock concept it, it, it is something that needs to be avoided uh, when you're going to procure. So, and, and actually, that point that you've made about procurement, you know, where in a year where a new procurement act is going to come in, it's you know the whole point of it is mm -hmm. an imagination uh, to embed innovation. And I've been talking about this over the last few months at, at various training events that we're holding. But there is this concept about how AI can be an influential part of responsible procurement and how it can be deployed in order to ensure that we are procuring in a transparent, fair and accountable manner through through independent audit of our processes. And actually, I think that mm. the, the whole point about procurement is it can be used as a lever of um, getting better value, getting better outcomes for citizens, making us more efficient organisations. And AI is a, an influential part of that. But if we haven't got the ability to actually understand what it is we need yeah. and then to actually buy yeah. it. Um, exactly. Yeah, I think that's going to be a major impediment. And, and there is no magic bullet. We can all say yeah. that, you know, we need to upscale and we need to get talent in uh, uh, and they're easy, easy uh, kind of things that for us all to reel off because they're truths, they're absolute truths. But the challenge for you, for every organisation, my own included, and everyone that I'm advising in this space is they're all looking for the right talent and the right solution. Uh, and actually, there is very few conduits of that knowledge. And yeah. actually, the expertise is evolving at such a speed. Um, yeah. 
it's really difficult to know where to look and when to kind of dip your 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 toe into the water so to speak so because this is such a fast moving environment and I really like the idea of doing it on a challenge by challenge basis on a on an issue by issue basis and the challenges in Cornwall are going to be very different to Hounslow mm. are going to be um for the West Midlands Combined Authority or some of the bigger metropolitan areas you know that you know that there, there needs to be an understanding that with all of the possible solutions they they need to work towards our top challenges wherever they may be um and whatever they may be and they they were cross uh, cross crossing you know nobody can avoid the fact that social care is um, a huge drain and efficiencies, if they can emerge, will be beneficial for everyone. But not every authority has a social care um, function or duty. Uh, and what are their challenges? So I, I think there needs to be uh, an acceptance that, you know, the way that this will evolve will be on a, a geographical and organisational basis. Yeah. Can I just come in really quickly? Please, please. I agree. And I think when, when London, you know, we've already had something called Lottie, which helps coordinate London's council's take up of AI but I think we probably need more pan London coordination for exactly the points that you were making because we need this the procurement expertise otherwise is spread too thin but if we can pool our procurement expertise and resource it means that risk would be mitigated um, and also Frankly, if we could do it across all of London councils, it would mean we'd all benefit from huge economies of scale. But otherwise, I think it'll be very difficult for for everyone to do it on their own. Because, as you said, there's this great gulf between the private sector and the public sector, with the private sector probably holding more of the cards at the moment. An unfair question for you there. But um, who do you think should be the, the convalescing body? Who should do that function? Is it a pre-existing organisation? Um, or do you think there should be something new set up uh, in order to, to provide that oversight? I think it's a really good question. I don't have the answer to it. I don't know whether, just because of the way London governance is so complicated. At the moment, we've managed to do very well in London councils coming together and doing it sort of voluntarily and giving people to be like, giving various councils pilot things and then we all copy in. It's voluntary whether you come in. So that kind of works. I don't know whether with the speed of this revolution coming in, whether you need to up it a level or whether it's something I don't think. Oh, well, it's not within the, the mayor's gift, I guess, because when the assembly and the mayor were set up, this wasn't even in a glimmer in anyone's mm. eyes. So it probably feeds into a broader conversation of whether London government is is completely fit for purpose at the moment. Um, and Jonathan's all, all over this. You know, when you look at devolution to different parts of the country, mm. the only model that nobody is talking about is is the London model. And yeah, I think we do need to look at it, actually. Rachel, um, with your kind of bigger strategic um, view from your roles in Solace and LLG, um, and, and throwing LGA in the mix there, should should it be a national conversation that somebody organises and orchestrates <laughs> rather than a regional one? I think, I mean, you need that national like backing, but I think essentially we're about devolution, aren't we now? That's the world we live in. So I would have thought it, it kind of ties in with levelling up um, and all the Devo deals and kind of that regional yeah. model, because that's what we've moved you know, London, yeah, I totally, you know, I'm always like, what about London? And they're like, that's just because you're from London. No, it's not. But no, I am from London and I love my Thank city. you, Rachel. <laughs> London is <as> unite. <laughs> I, I, I always say the deprivation in London, hello, is like Thank off you. the chain as well. But anyway, aside from that, I think that, yeah, regionally and, you know, just in terms of um, kind of some of the collaboration that's, already in place there uh whether it's west midlands or who was i speaking to recently was it the um uh oh it's escaped me now it'll come it'll come back to me the new county one there's like the new county uh, pardon mark rogers east midlands no no there's another one account anyway don't worry about that but 
I think there they are doing so much partnering work and also with all the stakeholders with with all the ICBs with that there's that whole care and um, uh, health and social care integration piece on prevention look at prevention preventions across everywhere like if everyone could focus on some of that preventative kind of um, um, health issues like getting getting there right from the outset so I think definitely regional I would have thought because it's just too big and if it just goes centrally it's just never going to happen is it it would just kind of be everyone just talking in the echo chamber and then we, what we need is task and finish we need something happening like something you know actual action and because of the speed and everything everyone spoke about and these are experts as well like London yeah we're expert for London okay and say West Midlands would be the same for their their patch so why you wouldn't want that to go up I think we've got you know enough of that just kind of what's kind of happening with the new office uh, for London and things like that just like whoa let's just keep it devolved and mm -hmm. and let people have control um, over their local powers, their areas, and doing the right things. But if we could link it with the funding, because the funding's what's kind of mm. going to be so critical in all of this, isn't it? So nationally, yeah, we need the funding uh, in that space. So I suppose that's where that national impetus comes to say, this is so important. This is what we're going to do, you know, um, and, and deal with it that way. And think tanks and all the good hubs and kind of innovation uh centers of innovation all important to kind of get fresh thinking and keep things alive in this space as well yes yeah, I mean, so that's one of the i was going to say that's one of the problems isn't it it's going to be funding because mm -hmm. there is no money whether it we've been told haven't we by, by the current government and yeah. any future government whichever way it is mm -hmm. it doesn't we Funding for local government is going to be very diminished and mm. quite a few councils are really feeling the pinch at the moment. So it's whether they have the, the ability to front load this, because we're all saying that it'll be really useful, that you'll be able to save resources, you know, you'll be able to redeploy staff or where it's really needed. But in order to do that, you have to have a bit of... Uh, sort of capability to do that and a lot of councils are very stretched and i'm not sure they will have that capability mm. i think it's got to be seen as well in, in, in the context of a national strategic plan for ai i'm sort of old enough in the tooth to remember kind of the, our first rodeo with this at the end of the of the of the 90s with the modernizing government paper and um the, just just the idea to get all local all councils to have their own website you had um, the Lord Mandelson had creating the office of the EN Voy down in Wilton Road. You had the central IT unit, so lots of you know, a very central push. And then um, you know, the, the creation of the LGA and the Improvement and Development Agency to ensure that you no know, good practice was being shared, disseminated quickly, so that local government was a keeping up to these quite arbitrary twenty five. 50%, 100% targets. I, I remember they were, they were in, in that great phrase from The Wire, duking the stats by including things like fax machines in electronic service delivery. But the, <laughs> I'd start arguing that you know, we living in revolutionary times. This is far more serious because there, yeah. um, th there is no time to lose on this. Councils will be risk being trapped in long term strategic decision making or or or, or 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 partnerships which they can't get out of. Hopefully, as Amber was saying, the Procurement Act with its impetus to innovation built in might be there. But I say, look, um, we, we've got some of the answers here. This has to be done at a at, at some regional level to ensure a, a mix of talent. You now, when we did a an evidence session in Cambridge last year for our Peace and Public Service Integration, the, the Deputy Chief of Cambridge City Council saying, well, put your heads out of the window. There's there's Google's HQ here. There, there's Amazon. How am I going to recruit a data analyst to exactly. work at a basic level for mm -hmm. this? These things have to be done at a at a level. And it's clear it's going to have to be, if this is seen, if local government is seen as a um, national, no, strategic national partner in national AI, there's got to be a way. And no, regardless of what guys off log has after the election, no, I wonder to have to assume the centre is going to have to have some 
duty of care and concern for local government's ability to marshal its resources to produce the best local service outcomes. Um, who knows? But it's going to have to be funded. And going back you know, into this issue, too, we know is it, I quite like your sort of minority report analysis on about uh, Elizabeth on how the, the preventative role of AI in the, in local services. It's um given you no know, reductions in local government workforce. Um, you no, know, again, AI is seen as the the. I mean, we all agreed around the table. There are no silver bullets for anything of this. Okay. How how we're supposed to kill all the werewolves is beyond me. But that 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 not 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 withstanding. It was put to me in terms of governance itself. Now, like all of you around the the panelists here. We've been looking around local government financial stability for many years with increasing concern. And it was put to me with someone who, who works around governance, wouldn't it be good, say, in terms of local government financial stability, if we could deploy AI to issue minority reports? What councils are more at risk based on the AI um, doing all the data crawling, what, no, looking through all sorts of things. But then in terms of the human factor, no, we're talking about culture of councils. Can we, is there, is there, is there any, um, uh, and I think the interesting thing about this conversation, we found more positives for the use of the technology than, 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 than downsides and risk. But is there a way to marry good use of algorithms and analysis with no, that the cultural issues which local government financial stewardship entail. Is there a sweet spot? Elizabeth, do you want to come in? Yeah, I, so I, this is probably a bit on the side, actually. I was thinking of culture because obviously in Kensington and Chelsea, we've had a whole lot of work really looking at our culture over the last seven years and thinking about how we should be more respons responsive and responsible to accountable to our residents. And I'll give you one eye thing of AI. So complaints. So complaints are really important for councils because you can see what's going wrong. You can see how people are behaving, you know. But we now have something which we deployed across um, all our customer services, which is a listening tool. And it listens in to um, our officers when they're dealing with complaints or dealing with housing repairs or whatever. And then it tells us how they're doing from the point of view of what words they're using in the tone. So you might come into work and you might think, oh, I'm in a really good mood today. And actually, I did my job really well and I was very polite and I was very friendly. Or you might come into work and you've, you've had, I don't know, a terrible commute in. Someone's been rude to you. Your coffee was disgusting and you're in a bad mood and you come in and you then might beat yourself up more when you're dealing with people who might not be so polite. So it's very useful having an algorithm which is actually not subjective, completely objective, and that we can then say, okay, well, our customer services are really good in 54% of the times or not other, and we can actually spot the trends and we can really see in an objective way how our culture is, is changing. So again, a bit like back to the practicalities on the ground, which is what I'm looking at. And I think AI is very useful. I think, and I'd just like to come into that, I, I actually, mm -hmm. there needs to be a bit of a, a symbiotic relationship between the AI and, and that human dimension, because there's sometimes there are certain decisions where absolutely subjectivity is needed, where, you know, there is the need to have a look at an individual's case and their circumstances, yes. particularly they're making very sensitive decisions about the allocation of uh, you know, diminished resource to help perhaps um, somebody in a social care context. Uh, and uh, an algorithm can make a very hard judgment. Having worked with my local um, social care unit um, to, for my um, ageing parents, that, that, that human contact and the ability to have that interface was absolutely fundamental. So I, I actually think there's a role, um, there's a balance to be struck I think between um, the use of uh, eliminating subject, and I know this is not what you were saying, Councillor, but I think it's it's enhancing that argument that actually some decisions are so human based um, yeah. that that an AI we can't AI is not the panacea for everything. No. 
no, no. But it's also there for checking whether your human base are getting it right. Absolutely. And, and so I think we're both agreeing. Yeah, and it's getting that balance right. And I think yeah. that that's going to be the journey for local government. Yes. Um, where that that sweet spot of the intersection between human decision making and and how that is valuable uh, and um, robotic decision making and how it is um, objective but f free of human um, emotions. How do you get that sweet spot? And actually, that's the journey that I think the public sector will experience far more than the private sector. Is in my experience of of the initial thinking around this as well. And and the earlier point, you know, there does need to be a place for blue sky thinking and in a sector that is absolutely um, ran to the ground in many ways in terms of additional powers and duties in reduced for, uh, a reduced funding environment with section 114 was coming out of you know uh, of so many authorities that we wouldn't have thought would have been possible five three years ago let alone five years ago where are we doing that thinking where are leaders being able to actually take some time out to think about these big strategic issues. Um, otherwise, there's a danger that uh, this technology advancement will be done to the sector rather mm -hmm. than done for the sector. And I think there's a very big difference between the two. Rachel, do you want to come in? From the no, no, factor? absolutely. No, I was just, um, I was just contemplating kind of in that I agree with uh, kind of both views uh, I think we're saying the same thing yeah. that yes you know it, it gives that checks and balances uh in kind of the example just given about listening in you know first I was like listening in but that that is how it works is it um and but then just kind of uh ensuring but also reaffirming and reassuring the public that don't worry it's never gonna kind of get to a stage where you know uh, it's really sensitive decisions where you need that human overlay and you know, a real person to make those really difficult judgments in intensive cases it's not going to take their place but then something came into my mind which is sometimes how even humans like we just get it so wrong like Sheffield Trees inquiry like hello like did no one think like this is an issue like Houston we've got a problem like let's go and fell like thousands of trees overnight <laughs> and it's all going to be fine I mean come on so it's 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 sorry so I was kind of dwelling on that just chuckling in my head but on a serious note it is about just in terms of that whole comms piece and giving that assurance because this thing is here it's been here for ages and it's here to stay and evolve and in a positive way not in a scary way but it is just ensuring that you know those distinctions are made and you know they're, they're really safeguarded um so i suppose yes um there's that yeah i, I suppose it's that that thought piece that thinking kind of you know what you was just saying there where 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 does that happen um yes we have them at conferences and things you know where leaders come together for a bit so we, we need something more uh more than that i think um to really as i said just at the beginning i was really surprised at kind of i thought we was a bit more ahead and maybe we are maybe it's just kind of that selection there but i just thought wow like guys need to get on the bus like fast as well um so yeah just as another just resident as well like taxpayer that's what I expect mm -hmm. and I think that's what everyone else does as well they just need to understand it but they really want us as leaders to be utilizing that public pound yes okay in the best effective efficient way for the right reasons and for the right you know the right conviction behind it and with value with integrity and you know from that ethical basis but we can't just go oh we just leave that there because we owe a duty to to our people to do to get it right really many thanks and yeah, that's um good your way to to end our, our our webinar doing right by our people we're using ethic the right ethical frameworks for ai so Without any further ado, I want to extend huge gratitude to our wonderful panellists today, Elizabeth Campbell, 
Amadeep Gill, you, Rachel McCoy. I thought it's been an enjoyable conversation, but essentially uh, what I took from this, there's more, I said, there's more positivity, there's more potential from here to really get things right at the level of place, whether it's um, down to the street level, Elizabeth, in terms of um, physical graffiti or that, why the um, combined services, whole place agenda, which straight and financial services will require. It will require getting it right, pro procuring it at the right level, using the Procurement Act to make sure we're buying right and at scale, and you know, having the sector work to improve the, the performance, the productivity and the improvement journey. This will all require, and it will always take strong place leadership to drive that all through. So I say mission successful. We will be running more webinars and Blue Sky thinking research and human dialogue based on how we can get the most out of AI. <laughs> I hope you can very much join us. We'll say goodbye for now, but with sincere thanks to our great panellists and anyone who's listened on today's call, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us at the Carlis if there are any further thoughts or considerations we can bear. But anyway, mission accomplished. We got through the hump morning of Monday, wishing everyone a very happy and beautiful Easter. Take wonderful care. Hope to see you all very soon. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.